Good morning, good afternoon, uh, welcome from the Maria Grzegorzewska University in Warsaw. And I would like to especially warmly welcome Claire, Professor Claire Cameron from UCL Institute of Education, Thomas Coram Research Unit, London, UK. Claire is a professor of social pedagogy at UCL Social Research Institute, and it's an honor to have her as a keynote speaker at the conference, Discourses of Childhood and Social Education, that takes place in Warsaw on the 2nd and 3rd of June 2022. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Anna. Now I'm going to, yeah, hear my, my presentation. Thank you. It's um, a delight to be with you, or if only from my study. Um, I'm gonna talk today about um, capable communities supporting children, what social pedagogy can offer. And I've got several photographs in here from, from one community that I'm working with quite a lot at the moment, which is in East London, it's called Tower Hamlets. And, and so this is a photograph of the canal and, um, and some of the buildings around it because communities are about place as well as about people. So I'm going to, without further ado, push on. I'm gonna to talk today, um, from some studies that I have been carrying out over the last 20 years or so. I started off as a social worker and um, as I went into academia, academic research with children and young people and became uh, aware of um, social pedagogy through studies in, in European nations, some of the work has been about bringing social pedagogy to the UK and I'm going to talk a little bit about, about that today. I could have drawn on any number of, of topics um, within social pedagogy, but I'm going to talk today a little bit about foster care with, with young children. And then I'm going to finish with talking a little bit about the Social Pedagogy Professional Association, um, which has emerged in the UK. So, move on. Yes, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about children, what are capable communities, what about a little bit about foster carers upbringing and then what do we mean by supporting via social pedagogy? Another picture of Tower Hamlets for you. Okay, so just to be clear, children are all those under 18 and they include those who are not citizens, they include those who are working in the armed forces, who are living independently in hospital or in custody. It's an age-related category. And in 1989, we had a Children Act in, in England, um, which for the first time stated that the uh, children, that children under the age of 18 had protected status. So uh, this was a recognition that prior to this act, um, children didn't have their own voice. So the, the, the act stated that in any uh, consideration of the ch of the child's welfare that came before a court, their best interests were paramount. So that set a new bar for 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 looking at what were in the best interests of children. But when the UN um, CRC uh, commented on uh, the the UK's approach to child well-being and child welfare and the best interests of a child. They commented in 2016 that many children feel they're not listened to by professionals or heard in policy making, that there's still some marginalization of children going on, particularly those who are in touch with professionals such as social workers. 
And then it also stated that the UK should ensure that act children are actively seen as citizens and that there is human rights education um, to raise awareness of the autonomy and responsibilities towards children. So there is some way to go for child well-being. Um, what does child well-being mean in England? And these were the comments of young people who were asked, what does well-being mean to you? And I think that asking children what makes them feel good is, is a very good way of understanding what well-being means. So they talk about relationships and feeling loved. They talk about the importance of place and safety in place, um, both out when they're with friends in neighbourhoods, but also at home, at school and online. They talk about being accepted for themselves without being judged by others. And they talk about their school environment, um, having decent school buildings and cultural practices that, that support young people. They talk about an absence of poverty, having enough money to meet basic needs, to be able to participate in society and not to have to worry about not having enough money. They talk about having a country at peace um, I say that's particularly relevant now, um, given what's happening in Europe. And they talk about the importance of having a say. So we can see in these kinds of statements that it's both an attitude, it's material goods, it's the environment in which children are, are living. And if you ask young children what they think well-being is, it's very similar. It's relationships of love and support. It's having plenty to do. It's being outdoors. And so we'll keep those thoughts in mind when we move into the discussion about foster care. But first, I want to say something about what's the position for children in England. Well, we can see that nearly a third of children are living in poverty. And that rises to a, about a half in urban inner London. And the place in the picture is Tower Hamlets again. In that borough, it's 56% of children are living in conditions of poverty. Um, we've seen a lot of health problems for young children. 20% um, of 11 year olds are obese, and that figure was pre pandemic. 42% in, in Tower Hamlets by the age of 11. And uh, obesity leads to uh, serious other health problems, such as obesity, which can last a lifetime. So, um, and also the, the pandemic has seen an alarming rise in obesity. So there are considerable health problems um, for children living in conditions of poverty. About 17% of children have serious mental health problems now. And of course, that's mostly older children rather than younger ones. But so it's even higher among, among the teenage age groups. And that 17% is um, a, a post pandemic figure. Then there are millions of children living with risk of violence, which could be anything to do with their family. Um, it could be to do with their parents having serious mental health problems or um, having domestic violence in homes or um, parents having um, substance misuse problems. And about a approaching a third are living in areas with unsafe air pollution. Um, and also about 20% in overcrowded housing. And all of these indicators suggest that there's a large minority of children whose well-being is at risk. And that's particularly the case in some urban areas. So what do we mean by capable communities, given what we've heard so far about child well-being and the environments where they live? I often use Bronfenbrenner's ecological systems theory as a way to understand where children are in relation to the community in which they live. And I'm sure the Bronfenbrenner model is familiar to this audience, but really it's saying that children typically find themselves enmeshed, enmeshed in various ecosystems from the most immediate environment of the home to school and more indirect environments and then social cultural values, and then changes over time. So these all these circles <coughs> are different types of community. There are connections between these circles and types of community. So there's organizations, the values, they're all interacting. 
so how this interaction is is the product of, of growing up i suppose and it suggests that communities are everywhere they are not just what's immediately around the child but the entire environment the whole system as it were the problem with this model is it doesn't necessarily privilege children's agency and this uh, is a crucial element i suggest in shaping the children's uh, children's relationships and activities around them um, we have to see the child as an active contributor to what's going on around them and this is particularly the case i think for children in care or children living in very disadvantaged circumstances um, and as we go on we'll see that some children in care are maybe neglected because their, their agency is not recognized and more social pedagogically one might see children as, as far more active in making sense of the world constructing their own ideas about what's going on around them and so the Bromford Venner model is a great starting point but it really needs to be elaborated and brought to life to bring about a, a, an account of how capable communities are supporting children and one of the very crucial elements in this I think is the role of social pedagogy in England and in the UK we often translate social pedagogy as education in its broadest sense and it's a the way that we have understood it over 20 years and I know it is different in different cultural contexts the way we've understood it and this was brought up constructed in relation to a study of what was happening in residential care um, in six European countries we drew up these principles and it's their part mindset and part practice in day-to-day -day work so the social pedagogue will see the child as a whole person with um, thoughts, feelings, multidimensional person who may be active or passive or uh, artistic or mechanical or the very many dimensions of a child. They may have spiritual beliefs, they may not. It's the whole being that you take on, not just the part of the child that pops up in front of a, of a consultant in a hospital or, or, or wherever. The social pedagogue also adopts an authentic, trusting, relational approach, not a task-based approach, which is very common in England. So a relational approach means you really invest in the person doing the relating as well as the person receiving the relationship. It's a mutual thing. That brings on to the, the shared daily life aspect of social pedagogic work, which was very evident in the residential care communities that we studied. The practitioners are practical, creative and reflective. They do, they make and they think about what they do and make with each other and, and with the people that they are looking after. So this, again, is moving away from a task based approach to um, imaginative approach. And really, what if would happen if we did, if we did this or we did that? How can we construct this or that? There's a big emphasis on teamwork and cooperation with families and neighbourhood. This, again, was um, quite new when we introduced it in 2006 to UK audiences, uh, particularly those from a residential care field who often were working in isolation from the communities, and families and neighbourhoods around them. And to carry on the uh, principles we saw the social pedagogic as a approach as a distinctive discipline in which the person is seen as a social agent. They have the capacity to act and should be respected as such that service users, adults and children are seen as equals acting in the mutuality. They may have different responsibilities, but there's a, a, a level playing field, as it were. Human rights, as, as we've already noted, underpin the, the whole approach. And the peer group is seen as a learning environment, as it were. You can learn from each other as you go through the day. And quite, quite important and again, quite different from the UK, theoretically informed, reflective and analytic practice. Um, it's a mindset, but it's also the product of deep knowledge um, and I think in many countries in reflective of a uh, higher education um, 
level qualification for practice. And, and finally, the, the importance of stance, um, employing, deploying the personal and the professional as a way of um, adopting a mindset that embodies the, um, the personal, the professional, the practical. All of these things together are embodied in your physical presence, the values that you want to portray. So as I said, these are common, and, um, but there are also diverse interpretations in many continental European states. And, and together, these indicate capability, um, capability of the practitioner that's embedded in theory and practice and values. So going to um, the specific case of foster care, we, some years ago, maybe 10 years ago, we undertook a, a round Europe um, kind of scope of what foster care looked like and whether or not it was seen as upbringing. And upbringing for us in, in the UK was a, a particular, had a particular social pedagogic meaning um, in other countries. When we looked at upbringing, we could see social pedagogue in, in some countries was referred to as bringing up by the roots. It really is taking a firm responsibility for, for upbringing of a child. And foster care is right in the middle of this. It's about bringing up children. And so we uh, uh, wrote a paper, myself and Mark Smith and, and Dalia, Daniela Reimer, about foster care as a cultural and caring endeavor, bringing together the accounts of foster care from, I think, 12 countries in Europe. Um, so it's a cultural endeavor because it's uh, embedded in the cultural values of any one society, but it's a, uh, it means passing on valued cultural heritage. So it, it's about shared norms and beliefs. So you can, you can imbue through the way that you look after a child in foster care, how to eat meals, how to stand for a bus, how to wait for a bus, how to employ, apply for jobs, how to go to school, all sorts of cultural norms are passed on through everyday life. And it's also a caring endeavor because you cannot be a foster carer without minding, caring, taking an interest in what's going to happen to that young person and, and almost being a living example of how to be, how to act, how to interact in society. So by living alongside someone, being together and sharing their life space, you can demonstrate caring. And by knowing, um, by asking questions, showing curiosity, being empathetic, you can show that you're caring too. And another role of the foster carer is to be an intermediary or advocate with other institutions and professionals. And nowhere was this more obvious than when we did a small study of foster carers um, with young children under, under school age, so there were zero to five-year-olds um, in London. And it was an ethnographic study, so we, we went to visit the foster carers three times and we got them to take photographs of everyday life. We had an interview with them, we did observations too. And we asked them about what they thought um, education was about and what was their role in education. And in order to do this, we um, asked them about what their everyday life was like. And it was completely clear from... Uh, their accounts, that their, their life was very, very complex and very, very busy. And this diagram illustrates some of that complexity. So at the top, we have um, the constant um, interaction with health professionals, health visitors, doctors, specialists of all kinds, consultants, physiotherapy, uh, in order to attend to the particular needs of the children that they were looking after. The foster carers also had constant interaction with the social workers and the local authority team, the municipality team that were very important uh, visitors to the home. Um, and then there was uh, learning and activities. There were the, the play groups, the toys, the park, the library, the swimming they all mentioned. This tended to take a, a back seat sometimes because of the demands of all of the other things that they, were, that they had to do. In fact, being in contact with birth parents could be, um, you know, between one and five times a week. And if that had to come first, if it was mandated by a court, 
um, then the birth parents' contact time was more important than going to a play group or to go swimming or to go to the park. Then, of course, the foster carers had their own responsibilities for their own family, um, that included shopping and caring for them. They had their own networks of friends and family and church. Um, and they also, in some cases, had support foster carers who would step in for them when they needed and of course there was the basic needs the love and affection the good food being part of the family so foster carers we saw were everyday experts and um, so when it comes to their perspectives on early education um, they saw education as um, structured or formal events that happened or experiences that happened outside the home it could be in play play groups or parks or libraries and delivered by professionals i.e not them not the foster carers they also saw that they had educational equipment in the home they had books and toys um, they had means to help let children learn the alphabet and some but not many talked about play-based learning sort of using bubbles and, and messy play. And, and the, the one who, who adopted play-based learning approaches was a trained um, early childhood worker. And she would make Play-Doh and use sand and, and everyday objects for play. So the one foster carer we had who um, saw herself as, as educational produced this, this we asked them all to produce these photo maps and this was hers and you can see that she's focusing on the ways in which a child's experience with her can be stimulating um so for example in the top left hand corner she says i love these toys this is the child they're noisy colorful and i like playing with them around the cot there are pictures um and the room is bright and colorful there are books um, and games, things we do together. There's the park outside the window. Um, we love playing here. And uh, she says, we blow bubbles, we scooter. Most of all, I love the slide. And then in the bottom left-hand corner, she says, my carer takes me here to see my mummy. And that's the, the birth mother's contact um, point. So that's one aspect of education educational perspective within the foster carers um, everyday life and this is another aspect of it which is enjoying life as part of a family and you can see that the foster carers competence and her values about child's upbringing and development are really to the fore here they show her getting alongside the child giving them voice and giving them aspirations on a par with her own children she's taking them child um, her, the child's eyes are, are blocked out in the picture in the in the uh, restaurant where she says all I ate were the chips but on that special day they were going to a university to see the foster carer's daughter graduate and she said that she hoped that an experience like this would help her foster child young as he was to grow up thinking that going to university was a thing for him and she also shows the um, having fun at the country show um, and, and going to a local park and having exciting trips out. And she could see that this kind of activity was also in itself educational. So what social pedagogy can offer in terms of this kind of foster care, one study, it needs further elaboration. It's part formal learning and part instinctive practice linked to theory. And we, we asked various early childhood experts um, to talk to us about what they thought education, uh, an educational approach with young children, particularly children with special needs, which many of these children have, was all about. And they talked about it in terms that really align with social pedagogy. They talked about learning in collaboration, fostering curiosity and enjoyment, promoting self-confidence, using play-based learning and problem solving. And one of the foster carers says, we worked with his interests to break things up, to allow him to do what he liked doing. It's about working with them or collaboration. 
another aspect of learning is learning in context and context which make the make what you're learning situated and meaningful and one of the experts said learning is a complicated network of children's engagement with other people with things and with places and what social pedagogy really offers i think and we've seen it in the session this morning in the ijsp discussion and in the the um, values part of what I, I i talked about in the principles earlier is is the values and ethics as a foundation for for practice so i'm going to just go on to talk a little bit now about the social pedagogy professional association because over the last years in britain um, in the uk and ireland there has been an attempt to um, make social pedagogy in give social pedagogy the kind of infrastructure the framework to be a, a national um, movement i suppose and uh, one of the first things that we did was develop a charter for social pedagogy. And Ireland has now come into the frame. So we have a charter for social pedagogy in the UK and Ireland. And um, this charter outlines the values and the, the mindset and the, the ways in which practice is undertaken. And uh, I think this is a, a very good way in which we bring to the fore the sort of philosophy underpinning social pedagogy. So it talks about ethics and social justice, the importance of engaging, engaging with others, the importance of practice that is congruent with values, import, the importance of theory, the value, the capacity of all to foster compassion, community, love, care and empathy. And we can see that, that uh, value of compassion and empathy very much in in the practice in the care field in Britain, but it doesn't necessarily have the overarching values that are being detailed here. So one important aspect is walking alongside others, recognizing their uniqueness and co-creating meaning and purpose. And so on, I won't go through them all. You're very welcome to, to go to the SPA website and have a look at this yourself and even to join SPA if you think that this is uh, a movement that you uh, aligns with your way of, of doing care work and educational work. So I'm just going to finish um, by rounding up and thinking about what social pedagogy can offer as a capable, as an example of a capable community. So in, in Britain, we've had long had a divide between education and care. And social pedagogy brings an educational lens to care practice and services. And this is really important in Britain because uh, to have just a care lens on, on what's going on, whether it's for older people or whether it's for very young children or whether it's for school children or, or, or people in prison or wherever they are being um, interacting with professionals, to have an educational lens means to project a longer term goals. It means to, to think about how the person can develop um, and how to help have the next steps in their life, as, as Lotta Harbour put it this morning. So not just the relationships, but where are you going and how is this going to help you get on with your life? A social pedagogy offers a recognition of the personal as well as the professional and the private self at work. And that's really important in the UK context, too, because um, very often professionals are seen as just inhabiting professional values um, and you keep your private values um, or your private self and characteristics away from the professional um, environment. But if you in incorporate the personal, then you start to recognise the artistic side of you that maybe isn't part of your job description or the musical side or the ways in which you can connect with somebody that you're working with through those talents and hobbies that you have that you can learn together. Social pedagogy is, as we've seen, rights and ethics based. And that again is a, is a foundation for practice that um, can often be overridden. It's supposedly embedded in regulations and laws, but it, in social pedagogy, it's kind of written into the very um, stance that the practitioner adopts. 
it also connects theory to practice. So having a because, having a, a knowing why one is doing something um, is always, always very important. But um, I can't finish without saying that social pedagogy cannot address the capable community all by itself. Whether you're a social pedagogue or a practitioner adopting social pedagogy practices, um, one is not operating in a vacuum. And the context of the collaborations um, are all vital. You've got to consider who's included and who's excluded in the community. Uh, which children are being excluded? Is it the children who are in prison that are not getting a service? Is it the children who are, um, in Britain's case, have no recourse to public funds because their parents arrived um, as illegal immigrants? What resources are available to families and to children to avoid the desperation of, for example, food poverty uh, or fuel poverty? And how is competence and policy and resources and practice enacted? What training um, and education is there for the practitioners and the policy makers. And finally, very finally, how are the values and methods that underpin the kind of relational support that social pedagogy offers, how are they embedded in the fabric of society? And just to say thank you very much for listening. And here are some references um, for the papers on which I drew in this talk. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you so much, Professor, Professor Clara Cameron from UCL, London. Thank you so much for connecting with us and making this conference an even better event than done before. Um, and now we will have a session for uh, individual presentations. And you can stay in this channel for this session. There will be an opportunity to take part in the workshop. There will be a link put in the chat for the workshop that starts parallel to the session at 14.55. Both the session and the parallel workshop finish at 15.55, so that at 1600 we can listen to Professor Kathleen Mannion from Royal Roads University in Canada. So thank you once again, Professor Cameron. We really enjoyed your presentation. And I invite Claudia, Joanna, Helena, and the presenters, Karuna, Paulina, all the presenters for the afternoon individual session. Thank you so much. <laughs>